Hello friends, today in the third part of our series on the secrets of the Kalashnikov machine reliability, I would like to discuss the bolt features of this system. A notable aspect I utilized was a rotating bolt, which at the time was not entirely new. A well-known example was the Lewis machine gun that utilized this technique during the First World War and the Civil War. It had a system with a rotating bolt. However, in the 30s and 40s, the armed forces generally favored a different approach, a different trend, seen not just in the Soviet Union but also in Germany and, in fact, across many continents. The most popular system at that time was one with a bolt skew. This term skew refers to how the bolt moved forward into position, closed the cartridge in the chamber and then moved downward, creating a sort of warp. In this position, it engaged with some of the mortar element. The boxes thus bore the load or transferred it in this direction. Why was it popular? Why did this scheme dominate? The fact is, at that time, manufacturing processes were significantly different. Unlike now, among milling operations, mainly milling was done from two coordinates, and as a rule, the machines were manually operated. Accordingly, technologies were adapted for simple 2D milling. If you look at any bolt carrier groups, we'll notice how they usually require a rotary bolt or so-called four-axis machining. This means three standard coordinates plus a fourth for rotation, which allows the piece to be turned and processed on each of its elements at a specific angle, making it not easy to execute. Such technologies did exist before CNC machines, but back then it was much more complex and considered a high form of craftsmanship. Now, that's not what I was talking about. The problem with bolt skew systems, why were they gradually phased out? How it works is that when a shot is fired, the pressure generated in the chamber is transmitted to the bolt and causes deformation. It is transferred to where the bolt rests against a fixed element. What does this area experience? Pressful loads cause it to briefly and temporarily compress into a contracted state for a microsecond. At this time, maximum pressure occurs in the chamber, expanding to fill the entire space. Afterward, as the pressure drops, there's no more load on the bolt, and it is under the influence of its internal stresses, it tries to return to its original shape, straightening out and thereby wedging tightly in the chamber. It becomes extremely difficult to pull it out of that. In manually loaded weapons, this is a problem. But let's see in automatic weapons, where the reload cycles are rapid. When the system tries to quickly move back to reload, usually there's some sort of breakage in the striker or a malfunction. Additionally, any slight temperature deviations errors in part processing or any other mass of errors accumulating will change the locking nodes' length and consequently it could malfunction. For this reason, it was quite common to include in the kit of automatic weapons, particularly more complex light and heavy machine guns, a special device for extracting stuck cartridges. You can look at cartridge casing available literature, for example, on the Dexiaria machine gun. It almost always presents such a problem with long locking lengths. This is essentially an accompanying defect, an inherent problem of systems with great locking unit lengths. These were also used in rotating bolt systems, like the Sapporo or the first generation of Schneider rifle, which, although no longer produced, had combat rest on its bolt. It's evident that the locking unit's length was also extremely large, leading to increased loads and potentially unnecessary problems affecting accuracy and causing issues with tears. Correctly designed rotating bolt systems, like the Kalashnikov assault rifle, allowed for a shorter locking duration. In the Kalashnikov, the bolt travels from where it absorbs the shock to where it rests against the elements in the receiver, maintaining a minimal length. This results in less deformation, with micro deformations being significantly reduced and thus the locking unit's length impacts less. Comparatively, these deformations are several times smaller in the Kalashnikov than in other systems with longer locks. Next, let's consider the combat rests. It would be interesting to compare the bolt in our canonical competitor to the Kalashnikov, the M16 or Ari-15. What are its characteristics? It has a bolt with eight lugs, which are combat stops and they are often positioned so that in size one of them had to be removed, and in place of one, position them in the throw, 
which will extract it, as is done in automatic machines like our Kalashnikov. So essentially, there are two combat stops, left and right, and the ejector is located at the retention. This combat pair strongly influence the bot's sensitivity to various defects, such as defects in work and subsequent defects in operation. One of the problems is sensitivity to any slight crack at any temperature. Once a crack appears, that's a problem. Usually, crack occurs somewhere in the corner of the combat stops because these are the most stress-laden areas. Now, let's consider we take a crack one millimeter deep at one combat stop, nine-tenths of a millimeter wide, it would be about 39% of the combat stop size, which is significant. For a smaller combat stop in a Kalashnikov assault rifle, which is 6.8 millimeters wide, the defect will be correspondingly smaller, around 15%. This difference in sensitivity is crucial. For this reason, in the production of bolts for the M16, their military specification called for non-destructive testing to identify any cracks. In the Kalashnikov, this is almost never done. Now, let's talk about a bolt with 8 lugs. In some rifles, another lug is removed, leaving only 6, but regardless, it reduces strength. I'm very interested in your opinion on this matter, especially from our attentive viewers. The fact is that the system has a large number of lugs, making it initially better for walking, as used in the automatic rifles of Johnson in 1945 in the USA. However, it's noteworthy that this system wasn't only used in American weapons. In fact, I would be interested to know if our attentive viewers can inform us whether such a system was used in any Soviet weapons. If you know, don't be lazy, write in the comments, and we can discuss this aspect. The next interesting point in the Kalashnikov system is the drive system for reversing the bolt. If among our viewers there are any conspiracy theories insist that Kalashnikov's design was stolen, I tell you, if you believe that something was borrowed from someone, don't be too lazy to read the original sources. Kalashnikov never hid which systems he borrowed the successful elements from and never made a secret of it. He never considered it shameful to study previous experience. In his memoirs, he openly wrote that initially, in his early carbine, the Korsh Nogopetrov, which was later called the Kalashnikov carbine and used in the Kalashnikov assault rifle. He took ideas from the American M1 rifle. He always had respect for the ingenuity of American design. Now, speaking about this system in our machine guns, we have a certain size radius for the combat stops. If we want to crank it up in any unfavorable conditions, how should we play it? How should we test this system? Recall the classic Archimedes, who said, Give me a lever and I will move the world. Here, the principle of leverage is operated. Kalashnikov uses an additional leading lug, or rather a guiding finger, which is located at a greater radius than the radius of the combat stops. This gives it an additional option to transfer effort to rotate the bolt. However, it is necessary to know it wasn't just a straight copy of the Garand system. The guiding lug in the Garand is located horizontally relative to the bolt, requiring its own pusher lever to translate the motion to it. This pusher, placed outside the dimensions of the bolt, increases the overall dimensions. The pusher in the receiver necessitates a larger and stronger receiver which doesn't necessarily add serviceability, rigidity or strength to the rifle. Placing these elements outside the dimensions of the receiver box makes it more susceptible to dirt. Kalashnikov, however, placed the guiding lug above, keeping it within the receiver's dimensions. This element is hidden inside, offering protection from dirt. Another aspect Kalashnikov considered and utilized smartly in his system is the shape of the groove that drives the bolt during movement. This groove causes the bolt to rotate, beginning the unlocking process. To understand the uniqueness of this system, one needs to consider its classical nature. It existed in the Lewis gun before Kalashnikov and the Garand, and even in the M16, which appeared much later. For some reason, they did not incorporate this proven experience. In the Kalashnikov, the guiding lug is also placed inside the bolt, and the receiver has a groove which the lug moves in, leading to the bolt's rotation during locking and unlocking. When the system recoils, the lug goes to the extreme position, having nowhere else to go. 
thus ensuring smooth operation without any issues. The problem occurs during the backward movement and when it starts moving forward. At this moment, if it is enclosed on all sides, the forward movement of the frame begins with the surface pushing the lug, pushing it until the force causes it to try to rotate, thereby unfolding. However, the friction force inside the receiver and under unfavorable. Thus deconditions, this may lead to delays and system failures. The system doesn't push forward, doesn't pull back, and doesn't function properly. Kalashnikov, a little later than the Goran, applied a special groove and a special edge. During the backward movement, it goes to this place, and when moving forward, it rests against this flat surface, thereby transmitting the load in a straight line. The forces that led to delays are not reflected, and in this way it moves forward to the extreme front position. At the barrel insert, there is a special inclined surface, which leads to preliminary braking. This simplifies the movement, and here it freely opens and closes. This is a big plus for the Kalashnikov assault rifle's locking systems. It also has a so-called preliminary brake. For those who are familiar with manual loading, like the classic masseur, you'll know that when the bolt rotates, its handle or a special element rolls onto an inclined surface of the receiver. This transforms the rotational movement of the bolt into backward movement. It allows the jammed cartridge to gradually be pulled off and ejected. This is a solution found in bolt rifles, and Kalashnikov used a similar, slightly modified scheme. In the Kalashnikov machine gun, you will see that the combat stops are not only at different distances along the length, but are arranged in a spiral, mirroring the spiral on the barrel liner, or master of combat positions, whatever you want to call it. This mechanism is used for both closing and opening the bolt, where it doesn't just perform a rotational movement, but also slides in a spiral, moving forward and backward. This design facilitates the ejection of the cartridge. Surprisingly, most modern rifles from the Western school, like the M16, lack this feature. They simply rotate around the corner, but remain at the same coordinate, in the same position. From my interactions with American and European designers, it's astonishing to find that many are unaware of such a design, even though it was originally a European development from the late 19th century. This highlights the problem of continuity in transmitting and accumulating information, both the positive aspects that should be utilized and the negative ones that should be avoided are crucial. We've been discussing these elements since the first video about the Soviet weapons. That concludes this discussion. Please leave your comments. They are very important. Helps us to get motivated. Also, feel free to ask questions. Hopefully, we will have more to discuss in the future. Don't forget to subscribe. Goodbye.